Hello, online arts community. Welcome to Fleetwood Jordan Theater's Stay Creative in collaboration with Piven Theater Workshop, a journey through the history of Black theater, a series with me, Professor Bria Walker. Today's lesson is part two of the Lorraine Hansberry series. In this segment, we'll dig deeper into Ms. Hansberry's life and explore her play, A Raisin in the Sun. As we learned in the last episode, Hansberry secured a producer in Philip Rose and began rewrites on her play. The new title becomes A Raisin in the Sun. In A Raisin in the Sun, Miss Hansberry drew upon the lives of the working class black people who rented from her father and went to school with her on Chicago's South Side. She also used members of her family as inspiration for her characters. Hansberry noted similarities between her mother, Nanny Hansberry and Mama Younger, and her father, Carl Hansberry and Big Walter. Walter Lee Jr. and Ruth were composites of Hansberry's brothers, their wives, and her sister, Mamie. In an interview, Hansberry laughingly said, quote, Beneath is me eight years ago, end quote. One of Philip Rose's first pitches of Raisin would be to a friend who had recently done a spoken word album for Glory Records. This friend just so happened to be the biggest movie star of the day, Sidney Poitier. And against his agent's wishes, he signed on to do the play. For the director, Poitier suggested his friend and former acting teacher, Lloyd Richards. Once word got out that a major play written by an African-American woman with 10 major roles for Black people was heading to Broadway, the Black theater community was abuzz. At this time, the majority of roles for Black people were stereotypical and didn't accurately represent African-American life. They were the D's, D's, and Dim kind of roles. Thousands of actors came out to audition. Richards had his eyes set on 32-year-old Ruby D. Initially, she was attracted to the role of Benita, but Richards wanted her for Ruth, Walter's wife. She was a bit hesitant at first because she had already played Poitier's wife in previous roles, but she was eventually won over. Richards would round out the cast with Louis Gossett Jr. as Benita's suitor, George Merchantson, Ivan Dixon as Asagai, Diana Sands as Benita, and a young Glenn Terman as Travis. According to Richards, they went to LA to find an actress to play the role of Mama, he exclaimed that they had a hard time finding her, that women were so trained to play the mammy roles Hollywood had wanted, and that he felt a lot of them had forgotten how to act. He happened to see Claudia McNeil in a Langston Hughes play and was taken by her performance, and he casted her in Raisin. Difficulties laid ahead for the production. Up to this point, only 10 dramas written by Black playwrights had been produced on Broadway, and they were all penned by men. You had a young, unknown Black female playwright writing about a Black family with a Black director, and it wasn't a musical. Philip Rose was having a hard time securing investors for the play, so he opted to have out-of-town tryouts for the show in New Haven, Connecticut, and Philadelphia. The New Haven run went well, but it didn't secure them a New York booking. Sidney Poitier's film, The Defiant Ones, was in the theaters and still drawing crowds, so now was as good a time as any to take advantage of the times. The show opened in Philadelphia and the audiences began to grow and grow, especially Black audiences. Novelist, playwright, poet, essayist, and friend of Hansberry, James Baldwin wrote, quote, Never in the history of the American theater had so much of the truth of Black people's lives been seen on the stage." End quote. The play caught the attention of Broadway theater producer John Schubert. He was impressed by the play and the response of the audience and decided to produce it on Broadway. On March 11th, 1959, the play would open on Broadway. The show began selling out and rave reviews poured in. A New York Times critic wrote, quote, the play has vigor as well as veracity and is likely to destroy the complacency of anyone who sees it, end quote. Hansberry became a celebrity overnight. Less than a month after the show opened, it won the New York Drama Critics Circle Award for Best American Play. 
Hansberry is the first African-American playwright and the youngest person ever to be given this honor. According to Princeton University professor Imani Perry, quote, many white Americans had a hard time hearing the protest message in the play because it's not necessarily what they wanted to hear. It's a much easier play to just read as a kind of neat, tidy story that has a happy ending, end quote. Literary critic Michael Anderson said, quote, you had white audiences applauding the younger family moving into a white neighborhood. And these are the people who would have been appalled had a black family moved in next to them, end quote. Pulitzer Prize winning playwright Lynn Nottage had this to say, quote, the form in which she wrote the play was very familiar. It was a family play. It was set in a living room. They could embrace the universality of that and sort of overlook the fact that it was about a very specific African-American family that was striving in a way that I don't think you saw a lot of people on the stage doing." End quote. When Poitier left to go back to Hollywood, Ruby Dee's real-life husband, Ossie Davis, joined the cast as Walter Lee. The show was translated into 30 languages and had a touring production. Hollywood had been bidding for the screen rights. Hansberry was adamant about writing the script. She had seen how Hollywood had portrayed black people in its movies and was not interested in turning it into an untruthful portrayal of African-American life. Columbia Studio won the rights. After meeting, studio executives wrote, quote, it was agreed that the addition of race issue material in the screenplay should be avoided. The introduction of further race issue elements may lessen the sympathy of the audience, give the effect of propagandistic writing, and so weaken the story." End quote. Hansberry refused to water down the so-called race issue material in the script. She fought every step of the way, but was met with resistance and lost battles along the way. The studio forced the director to cut some of the race material. Even more was cut in the editing room. The film did modest at the box office. Hansberry publicly claimed to be pleased with the film. In 1957, during the process of raising, Hansberry and her husband separated before the play even hit the stage. In 1962, they would divorce. But even though they divorced, they remained friends and continued to work together. Hansberry was very public about her political thoughts and beliefs, but was very private about her sexuality. During the late 50s, she wrote four short stories on lesbians under the pseudonym Emily Jones. The late 50s was an oppressive time. Homosexuals were marginalized and she had to be careful to a fault. There was no real community for her. The intersectionality of being black, gay, an artist, and a woman wasn't really a concept yet. She began to experience debilitating stomach pains and moved to the Hudson Valley of New York to gain privacy and focus on her writing. Her pains would slow her writing process down. Towards the end of her life, she wrote more and more for the civil rights movement. It allowed her to take part, even though she couldn't physically be there. She also worked on her second play, The Sign in Sidney Brewstein's Window. On May 1st, 1964, she left the hospital to speak to the six teenage winners of a national creative writing contest. This is where she would coin the phrase, young, gifted, and black. According to Professor Imani Perry, quote, people hadn't largely adopted the designation black. She makes it into something that is powerful and beautiful, end quote. On January 12th, 1965, after the sign in Sidney Brewstein's window opens on Broadway, Hansberry succumbs to her battle with pancreatic cancer and dies. Over 600 mourners attended her funeral. Some folks in attendance were Malcolm X, Sammy Davis Jr., Ossie Davis, Ruby Dee, Paul Robeson, and Rita Moreno. Nina Simone sang, and Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. sent a telegram honoring her life. After her death, her ex-husband adapted a collection of her work, correspondence, and interviews together in a show entitled To Be Young, Gifted, and Black. It opened off-Broadway with an eight-month run at the Cherry Lane Theater. The same year, To Be Young, Gifted, and Black 
Lorraine Hansberry and her own words, adapted by Robert Nemiroff, was published. Lorraine Hansberry was a true artist. Her plays, writings, words, and thoughts have inspired people of many generations and cultures. I can't help but wonder and imagine who she might have been were she able to walk our earth a little longer. We will never know, but the art she has contributed to our world is undoubtedly some of the most moving work any of us will ever witness. Join us next time as we turn another page in the history of Black theater.